morning and welcome to worship. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Transfiguration Sunday. A lot going on today. I am Reverend Suzanne Goodwin. I am pleased to be the pastor here at Mason First United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you are joining us to worship this morning. Even though we're not all gathered together uh, in one place today, we are gathered together by the Holy Spirit. If you're new with us, if this is your first time worshiping with us, we're glad that you've chosen to join us. And we hope that once we're able to worship again in the sanctuary that you will uh, join us and we will be delighted to get to know you at that time. I want to say thank you to Dennis Howe for his wonderful service last week on forgiveness as I was uh, quarantining up north uh, after having done a wedding the weekend before. So uh, Dennis always does a fine job and it's always good to have another voice in the pulpit. Uh, so thank you, Dennis. This Ash Wednesday, much to my sadness, we will not be able to gather here in the sanctuary and worship as we enter into Lent. but. We have figured out a COVID safe way for you to come to the church and um, experience this really important transitional um, day of worship. And so we are going to be offering a prayer walk throughout the building. And we'll have two entrances to the church open. We'll have the barrier free entrance from the parking lot open, as well as the main entrance up that sloped sidewalk uh, into the entrance nearest the office. And you'll come in to uh, where the fellowship hall is. There'll be a video playing on the screen there that will t give you some instructions. And uh, then when the first prayer station is open, you'll enter in to fellowship hall, spend some time at the first station. There's a couple of stations in the chapel and in that individual chapel uh, in the same hallway. And then you'll make your way to the narthex outside the sanctuary. And then the final station will be communion here in the sanctuary with individually wrapped uh, communion cups. So it's all very safe from a COVID perspective and an opportunity for you to just contemplate and pray and um, prepare yourself for this Lenten season that we enter into. I, I think it will be a good experience. I hope that you're able to come by and do that. The, the church will be open from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. for you to uh, do this prayer walk at your leisure. And finally, we will be starting our Lenten series. Uh, I had said last week, or maybe it was two weeks ago, that we would begin it the following week, and the Sunday Lenten study will begin the following Sunday, but um, the Tuesday Lenten study will begin this coming Tuesday, and there's a, a reason for that. But um, if you would like to participate in either the 10 a.m. or 7 p.m. Um, Lenten study that happens on Tuesday via Zoom, uh, please just let me know so that I can send you the Zoom link. Books are available in the church office. They're $9, and all are welcome. Uh, we would love to have you as part of that discussion group. The Lenten series is called The God We Know, and it is the study of the I Am sayings of Jesus. And with that, let us prepare our hearts for worship. We see light, hope, and joy. We bring heart, soul, mind, and body. We share blessings and fears. We bring faith and doubt. With all that we are and all that we have, let us worship God. Our opening hymn is Maker in Whom We Live.
of how we worship together is our prayer life. As we share the prayer concerns of our congregation, as we take those prayers home with us and part of our daily prayer practice, we pray for one another. And we may never know the way those prayers touch the lives of uh, the people that we're praying for. I'm privileged as pastor to sometimes get some of that feedback of what that meant to the person being prayed for. So know that even though you may not know the outcome of the prayers that you pray, they're important. They're an important part of how we uplift one another and care for one another. As we enter into our time of prayer today, uh, I want to lift Brenda, uh, Glenda Kreider, who um, is in the hospital as of today, but should be coming home, we think, in the next um, day or two. And she is recovering from a stroke. Phyllis Beisch is also in the hospital. Uh, she is having a heart procedure, and we're hoping that once that is done, that she also will come home in fairly short order, but we don't know that uh, at this moment. So please continue to pray for Phyllis. We continue our prayers for Dick Magsig, Lou Tibbetts. Bev Fiesel, she's one of our newer members, um, fell and broke her arm, so she is recovering from that. Um, Danielle Robson, also uh, one of our newer members, is recovering from ankle surgery. We continue to pray for Ken Gettler. And I am asking for a special prayer request. Uh, Christopher Darian is one of the youth that was part of my youth group when I was a youth pastor. He's a young man of about 26 years old now. He was going to law school in Boston and just received word that he has a serious form of pediatric cancer. Um, it's very serious. And uh, it's a very, it's a difficult situation for his family, obviously, and for me, um, as he is one of my kids. So if you would pray for the Darien family and for Chris, I would appreciate that. Let us go to God in prayer. O oh God of grace and hope, we come to this time of worship at different times and in different places, and yet we're drawn together into one family of faith because we are your children. No differences between us could ever be greater than the love that unites us 
because you are our God. Your love is vast. Your mercy knows no bounds. Your grace is immeasurable. And all of this you give to us so that we may live well and know the goodness of your creation. Thank you, God, for calling us into community with each other and with you. Thank you for the blessings you pour out into us. Thank you for your calling to serve and to be more than we ever thought that we could be. May our response to your good gifts be an expression of generosity as we share your good news with others. Holy and loving God, this morning as we worship together, our hearts are filled with concern for those who continue to give so much to this fight against the COVID pandemic. Bless each and every one for their sacrifices and for their commitment to bringing your healing to people in need. And we ask for your attendance upon those who have been hurt economically by this pandemic. Open paths of resources for them and help those who have resources to find avenues of generosity to assist those who are in need. Help us as a church to be resourceful in finding ways to serve and meet the needs of the hungry and the sick and the sick at heart. Lord, this morning we particularly ask for your care for those we have named who are each in their own way battling sickness and injury to the body. We ask for your healing touch on each of them and that you surround them with the comfort of your presence. And Lord, we ask for those who are struggling with fear, with depression and loneliness, with anxiety and other pains of the mind, heart, and soul. Give them strength and hope and the assurance of your immediate presence. Lord, we are still struggling as a nation and as a world. We have allowed ourselves to be pitted against one another as if we were enemies and not all citizens of the same planet, children of the same God. Help us to forsake building walls and to commit ourselves to building bridges. Give us hearts for peace. Give us wisdom to solve our problems together. Give us vision to focus on what is good and just and kind. May you be our light and our hope. Lord, as we look forward to a new season where new life brings new opportunity, may we resolve to be better people, a stronger church, a community and nation of high moral integrity. Let us live up to the two commandments put forth by our Savior who taught us to love you and to love one another. May our efforts sow seeds that bear fruit to feed a hungry world. God, all of this we ask in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If we were gathered here today in the sanctuary, we would at this time bring our gifts forward, but um, we continue to offer our gifts and our generosity uh, through the mail, through EFT, through um, online giving, and so forth. And those gifts are still an act of worship, and they are still a tribute to a God who has been so very generous with us. We ask God to bless those gifts, that they might be multiplied and that we might continue to answer God's call to do good work where there is great need. I thank you for your faithfulness and for your generosity. Let us pray. Generous and loving God, we give you thanks for the wealth of blessings that you have poured out into us. 
May the gifts we bring and send be a blessing to others, and may they always be acceptable in your sight, useful for building a kingdom and transforming the world. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let us join our voices together in the doxology. When I first arrived at this church, it didn't take me any time at all to feel and sense that there's something really good going on here, that this is a good place to be, that people here are excited about the ministry that God calls them to, that there is an honest desire to grow in faith and to serve others and to share the love of Christ. There is no question in my mind that the Holy Spirit is at work here in this church. Today I'm going to be talking about, in the message, about our theology of grace. And grace is a gift that comes to us through the active work of the Holy Spirit. As we prepare our hearts to hear scripture and to hear the message, let us sing together the Spirit song. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. 
God who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved. God raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. This is the word of God for the people of God, to which we say, thanks be to God. It was a bit of a challenge to figure out what I wanted to preach about this Sunday. It's Valentine's Day, and love is always a good subject for worship. You can't lose talking about love. And it's also Transfiguration Sunday, which I know everybody is excited about. Lots of Transfiguration celebrations going on today, I'm sure. But in the end, I decided to go ahead and do one last message in our What We Believe series. Not that we have by any means covered all that can be said about what we believe, but to leave this one out would leave a gaping hole in the lineup. In case you've not been following this series, it was inspired by the occasional question that I get um, to offer a, a confirmation class for adults. And of course, this series can't possibly take the place of good interactive discussion about what we believe, but I do think that it's helpful every now and then for us to remind ourselves of the things that are important in our faith. Because it's not entirely unusual to be asked by an acquaintance, why are you a Methodist? Or what do Methodists believe anyway? Or what's the difference between Methodists and Baptists? And these are questions that I hope that you can answer casually, but with conviction. And if not, hopefully this series has helped. But if you ever want to talk in greater detail, please let me know. As a certified Methodork, uh, I really enjoy talking about all things Methodist, so I'm happy to sit down and talk with you and help you find an authentic way to talk about the beliefs that are most important to you personally. So, when we started this series, I picked a few of the defining Methodist doctrines that I would normally highlight in a confirmation class. We talked about the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion. And we talked about the importance of social justice, the practice of living out Jesus' commandment to love our neighbors. We talked about our belief in the Bible and how we believe that scripture uh, is holy and truthful in its revelation of who God is and who we are as God's people, while at the same time understanding that the context often reflects the perspectives of cultures that are vastly different from our own. And we talked about the belief that all of us are called to discipleship according to the gifts of the Spirit given to each one of us personally. We're all called to be in ministry in some form or fashion. And all of these are hallmarks of United Methodist doctrine. All of these are conversations that I would normally have with a confirmation class with students preparing to become full members of the church. But these are not the only conversations I would have. Today, we're gonna to be talking about a defining belief of the United Methodist Church. And that is, I know if you were all here, you would shout it out together, grace. We can hardly say anything about what Methodists believe without talking about grace. So what is grace? The United Methodist Book of Discipline defines grace as the undeserved, unmerited, loving act, action of God in human existence through the ever-present Holy Spirit. 
Grace pervades all of creation and is universally present. Grace is God's active presence, creating, healing, forgiving, reconciling, and transforming human hearts, communities, and all of creation. Wherever God is present, there is grace. Grace brought creation into existence. Grace birthed human beings. Grace is what bestows on us a divine image. Grace redeems us in Jesus Christ. And grace is ever transforming all of creation into the realm of God's reign of compassion, justice, generosity, and peace. In other words, grace is the essence of God's relationship with us. We haven't done and we don't need to do anything to earn it. We can't earn it. It's just the magnitude of God's love for us, acting in our lives through the Holy Spirit. John Wesley wrote many sermons which worked through this theological understanding of grace and how it works in saving and transforming our lives. He came to outline a journey of grace that transforms, that brings us to salvation, creating and healing, reconciling, redeeming, and perfecting. He described three particular movements or expressions of grace, and he called this the scripture way of salvation. The first movement of grace is provenient grace or the grace that goes before. John Wesley compared it to the porch on a house, the place where you prepare to enter, and yet you're not in yet, but you're covered and you're protected, getting ready to go in. We understand this grace, this activity of God to be present before a person is able to choose and enter into a relationship with God of their own volition. Provenient grace is present in babies and children, in people who have not yet been introduced to God, in people who have disabilities which might prevent them from understanding or entering into an accountable relationship with God. God's love is still active and present in these people. Baptism is an outward and visible sign of God's provenient grace an acknowledgement of God's claim on our lives even before we're able to accept it for ourselves. But as we grow and mature and gain knowledge and control over our own actions and choices, we reach a point where we are now able to freely accept and choose to enter into relationship with God. We say yes to God's grace, yes to that relationship. And at that time, we make a commitment to renounce the influences of sin and publicly proclaim our intention to live in obedience to God's law of love. And this marks a moment of justifying grace. Justification meaning pardon, the forgiveness of our sins, which brings us into a right relationship with God, an alignment with God. Provenient grace is what prepares us to enter into this justifying grace. In our house analogy, if provenient grace is the porch, then justifying or saving grace is the doorway into a new identity, into a new creation. John Wesley had long been in relationship with God. He had been a Christian all his life. His mother had raised him to be in relationship with God. But as an adult, he had some difficult life experiences that shook his confidence in the depth of his faith and made him question if he really truly trusted God with his whole being. On May 24th, 1738, while at a prayer meeting at Aldersgate Street, the leader was uh, describing the change that God works in the heart through faith in Christ. And Wesley wrote that at that moment, he felt his heart strangely warmed. He felt that he did trust in Christ and that he believed that Christ was the source of his salvation. 
He felt the assurance that his sins were forgiven and his life no longer under the subjugation of sin and inevitable death. This moment of justifying grace was a profound experience to John Wesley. For many of us who have a long history of being raised in the church or in faith, we don't identify with a specific moment of salvation that many of our more evangelical brothers and sisters often speak of. But when we look back on our journey of faith, there is often a moment, maybe less dramatic than Wesley's, where we come to terms with our conviction in faith. A time when we take our faith journey off autopilot and say, yes, I want this. Yes, I trust Jesus. Yes, I trust that God's way of love is better than any plan that I can come up with on my own. And so I'm going to focus my life differently. I'm no longer along for the ride. I'm choosing to go. And that's justifying grace. What then? Now that we've chosen this life of relationship with God, does that mean that the journey is over? That we've arrived at our final destination? What is the point of living in relationship with God? Trust me when I say that we are not made perfect in that moment. Now the journey begins to get interesting. Now we commit ourselves to living in sync with God's plan with God's guidance. We're allowing God's sanctifying grace to work in us, redeeming us and polishing us and helping us to find our purpose in God's creation. We are allowing God to shape us and perfect us. John Wesley believed that while few, if any of us ever reach the point of perfection, it's possible to have moments where our lives are so intensely focused on God, so finely attuned to God's divine purpose for our lives that we're completely unable to think about anything else. And in those brief moments, we do experience perfection. As Methodists, we believe that grace is both a gift and a response. Our identity as sons and daughters of God is a gift to us. Living in the world as redeemed children of God is our gift to God. Grace compels us and moves us along this journey towards wholeness. Grace continuously forms us in the likeness of Christ and sheds the love of God abroad in our hearts, our actions, and our relationships. Grace smooths our rough edges and shapes us into something beautiful and pleasing to God. Wesley believed that God's grace is universally present in all and irresistible in none. However, even as God's presence and power to create, forgive, reconcile, and transform are universally and persistently present, we can resist God's gracious presence and God's work in us in the world. Freedom to say no to God, to God's invitation to be reconciled and transformed, and transformed remains. Contrary to the Calvinists of his time, Wesley believed that we can lose our responsiveness to grace and thereby backslide or shut ourselves off from God's grace. And yet God's grace remains steadfast, ever blessing, sustaining, and beckoning us toward wholeness and salvation. All of this, all of this is what I teach in a confirmation class as a fundamental understanding of how God is at work in us. Grace is how we're drawn to God. Grace is how we experience God's love. Grace is how we resist sin and temptation. Grace is God's capacity to forgive us when we mess it all up so badly. Irresistible grace is what keeps drawing us back again and again to that which is good. Grace gives our lives purpose. Grace is what brings us into eternal relationship with God when our earthly lives are over. 
it's impossible to talk about what Methodists believe without talking about grace. But all of this is a bit cerebral. Even though the action of grace is of the heart and soul, and so I ask you to think about, what does grace mean to you? If your life depended on your ability to describe what grace is and does for you, could you do it? Could you convince someone else of how grace saves you and uplifts you every day of your life? Grace is a gift, a gift of infinite and unmerited love and forgiveness. But we have some weird ways of accepting it and treasuring it. Some of us take this gift and we acknowledge its receipt. We might even go so far as to say thank you to God for giving us this gift. But we never open it and take it out of the box and test it to see what it can do. Some of us do take it out and we look it over and we decide it's too special to use every day, that we're going to save it for a special occasion and we put it someplace safe, where we just use it sometimes. But I think that God meant for this awesome gift to be used well and often. We are supposed to wake up and immediately wrap ourselves up in it and fill ourselves up with it and use it to interpret and guide all that we say and do. Grace is our compass and our energy and our stamina and it won't wear out, it won't fade, it won't run out. We can't use it all up and then suddenly find out that we don't have any more of it. We need to use grace to find perspective on our day. We need to use it to shape our thoughts and to polish our words. We need to use it to fuel our generosity. We should use it to diminish our stress and to soften our anger and our anxiety. We absolutely, absolutely need to use grace in every aspect of our relationships with our spouses, with our children, with our friends and acquaintances. We need to use grace with the store clerk who's more interested in going on break than serving our needs. We need to tap into grace when distracted drivers cut us off in traffic. We need to be filled with grace for those who don't have enough food to eat and for those who come and take everything out of the food pantry and leave nothing for others. We need to mainline grace when people espouse views and opinions that are wildly divergent from our own. We need to tape our mouths shut with grace when our thoughts are filled with anger and condemnation and when our words will not bring remedy or improvement to an already difficult situation. We need to fill our being with grace when we're challenged to love the unlikable. The hallmark of our faith is to be so filled with grace that we cannot help but overflow it to others. We are so wealthy in grace. We are so loved and so forgiven that there is an unlimited amount of it to share with others. And unlike any other gift, this gift costs us nothing. You can give it as extravagantly as you have received it, and you will never run out of it. You can give away twice as much grace as you think you have stored up, and you'll find that the tank just keeps refilling. And while it doesn't cost you anything to give it, for the person who receives it, it just may be the most extravagant gift they ever receive. These times that we're in right now are beyond difficult. We are witnessing the dimming of hope, which is, in my opinion, a deficiency of grace. And it's not that there's not enough grace to remedy our current situation. It's that we seem to have forgotten that we have it and what to do with it. But if you want to know if we can ever get beyond what we're going through right now, the answer is unequivocally yes. But it will take a reckoning of grace. We need to tap into it and let it flow freely. 
and grace will be our hope and our salvation. This is what we believe. Amen. Let us pray. God of grace and glory, open our hearts and lives to your grace. Help us gain intimate acquaintance with this awesome, life-transforming gift. And as we grow more fully into your sanctifying and perfecting grace, may we make it our mission and our purpose to model and encourage grace in others. This we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us and the Holy Spirit who guides us ever in grace. Amen. As we move into this season of Lent this week, we're going to step away from this series on what we believe. But before we do, I want to point out one really important aspect of Methodist belief that pertains to everything that I've shared over the past few weeks and all that I'll ever preach in the future. The Methodist movement, which became the United Methodist Church, was built on a theology of grace that makes room for people to grow. Our most sincere hope is that our church will create a safe space for people of all walks of life to come and to worship and fellowship and grow into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that means that different people with different experiences may believe different things. And there is room in this church on Ash Street and in the Greater Methodist Church for you to believe differently. And yet, you will always be welcome here. If this is the place where you can find God and draw closer to God, then that is all that matters. People sometimes say that this openness means that Methodists don't know what they believe, and I would argue that passionately. The United Methodist Church has a distinct theology and a defined doctrine, but that doesn't mean that every person in the pew has a personal faith that has been stamped out of a Methodist-shaped mold, and that is okay. Not even every pastor believes precisely the same way. And that too is okay. Although it is the responsibility of a pastor to uphold the teachings of the church and to be clear when our personal perspectives enter into our interpretations. If I have taught anything in days past that you don't agree with, I'm not particularly bothered by that. And I hope that you won't be either. What matters is that we can share a meal from the same loaf and drink from the same cup that is the grace of Jesus Christ, and we can still call one another brother and sister in Christian love. In the days to come, as we live into our understanding of God's calling to extend invitation and faithful hospitality to new friends and families in our community, we're going to need to take our grace off the shelf and dust it off and make good use of it. We may greet friends who think differently, who look different, who love differently, or who have noisy children. And it's all good. We have room for everyone. Because Grace tells us that what we want most for our church is for it to be filled with people who are seeking God. And absolutely nothing is more important than that. There is grace here for everyone. This is what we believe. Let us join our voices in singing our closing hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
forget, uh, this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, and we'll have the prayer walk here at the church. And we will also be recording an Ash Wednesday devotion service to post online for you to worship if you can't come to the prayer walk. Go into this coming week sure in the knowledge of God's activity in your life, filling you with grace and love so that you have plenty to share with others. Be generous and faithful today and all days. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>